Well, I know we have more registered, but we might as well get started. We want to give Phyllis the whole hour of time. So we appreciate you being here today. Thank you for joining us for our 2023 Fall Tuesday Talent Series. Today, our session is Healthy Labor Markets and Quality Jobs in Northern Colorado with Dr. Phyllis Resnick. Our um, sponsor for the Tuesday Talent Series is Plant Moran. Plant Moran is among the nation's largest accounting tax, consulting, and wealth management firms, and provides a full line of services to organizations in the following industries, manufacturing and distribution, financial services, service, healthcare, private equity, public sector, real estate, construction, and energy. Plant Moran has a staff of more than 3,300 professionals throughout the United States with international offices in Shanghai, China, Mumbai, India, Tokyo, Japan, and Monterey, Mexico. In Colorado, Plant Moran has served its Colorado clients for more than 40 years with offices in Broomfield, Denver, and Fort Collins. Plant Moran has been recognized by a number of organizations, including Fortune Magazine, as one of the country's best places to work. For more information, visit plantmoran.com. So I'm super excited to introduce you all to Dr. Phyllis Resnick. She's an economist and policy researcher with over 30 years experience as a consulting economist and as the director of Policy Research Institute. Her expertise is macro fiscal modeling and forecasting, economic impact analysis, and the socioeconomics and demographics of communities from urban to rural. Dr. Resnick currently serves as the executive director and lead economist of the Colorado Future Center at Colorado State University an institute she co-founded in the mid-2000s. She's the lead modeler for the center's Colorado Cast, the state's only short-term forecast of economic activity, and she previously led the center's award-winning fiscal sustainability study. And there's a little bit more I just want you to hear. Her forecasts have been integral to budget decisions for the University of Colorado, the states of Colorado and Hawaii, the Colorado cities of Boulder, Arvada, Denver, and Aurora, the state transportation budget, and public enterprises, including Excel Energy and Colorado's many metropolitan planning organizations. Her models have also been deployed internationally in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning in Rwanda, where she has served twice as short-term embedded consultant in the ministry. Dr. Resnick also serves on the technical assistance team for the International Monetary Fund in East Africa. Prior to COVID, she led micro, macro fiscal trainings in Tanzania and Ethiopia. Dr. Resnick holds an MA in Economics, Environmental, Resource Economics, Public Finance, and a PhD in a Public Affairs from the University of Colorado. It's amazing that she's just four blocks from us here at Colorado State University, and we have such an amazing, talented star among us. So super excited to have Dr. Resnick join us today. Dr. Resnick, you can take yeah. it away. <laughs> well, good morning, and that's thank you for the, the introduction and the invitation to join you. Um, Let's see, can I grab control of the screen? Uh, yes, okay. Um, since we have such a small group, I'm happy to make this more of a conversation. And so I have prepared slides. Um, I took a little bit of liberty with what Yvonne asked me to talk about, and I'll, I'll kind of tell you the places where I've done that. But I'm also happy to, you know, if, if you know, I might tell you, I don't have the exact answer on the top of my head, but if there's a question or a conversation you want to vector off into, we can take advantage of being just a couple of us and um, kind of make this a, a chart your own adventure kind of experience. There's always a risk in doing that, but we can certainly try. But um, what I have prepared today is to talk about labor markets. And this was um, initiated when Yvonne approached me and asked, to talk about kind of the intersection between the minimum wage as a policy instrument and you know what it takes to keep labor markets healthy. And um, you know, I had to be honest with her. I hadn't done a whole lot of work on minimum wage in the short term. And um, I had done some work early on that I'll share with you. And I was a little bit uncomfortable with wading into something that could potentially be political. We try not to do that. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, I think it's important that we talk about, you know, all the policy instruments that are available to us to keep labor markets um, sustainable and healthy. And so I went and did a little digging and um, 
Not surprisingly, it turns out that our friends at the Congressional Budget Office are doing work on minimum wage. This is a model that I believe they created this year. The, um, the URL for the website is right here, and you'll have the slides when I'm complete. So if you want to go and play around with this, this is an interactive model where you can look. I guess they're using you know national data. They're looking at raising the, the um, minimum wage nationally and what the impacts would be on jobs and poverty and some other macroeconomic indicators. Um, they have kind of a simulated example on the splash page of their site when you load it. And so I just took a screenshot of it because I think it's a nice way of talking about the fact that in economics, there's never, or I would say almost never a policy that's universally good or universally bad. You know, typically when we use policy instruments in economics, we have winners and losers. And there's all kinds of theory about why that's okay from a utilitarian perspective that I won't get into. But it's important to understand that in each one of these interventions that we make, um, they tend to benefit some people and they tend to potentially harm others. And typically what we do, hopefully, is we try and find policies where the pool of benefits exceeds the harm that's caused by enough that it's um, justifiable or you know sort of worth the risk to try a policy intervention. And so, you know, as economists, we like to build models to try and understand what those trade-offs are. And I thought this one from the CBO is really nice. So it looks at, in kind of the Northwest corner here where it says minimum hourly wages, that's just their sort of um, step sequence graph of what would happen if we went to what their scenario is, which is raise the minimum wage nationally by $15 to 2027. Again, this is just a national example. It's not intended to um, be exactly what we consider here in Colorado. And so you see what would happen to wages. And so then, you know, the typical argument from economists around minimum wage is that if you raise minimum wages for the people who can retain their jobs, they will get paid more, but that it will actually also cost some jobs because if you have a pool of of um, money available to pay employees and you have to pay some more, in theory, it could mean that you have fewer employees because you can't afford to um, sustain the level of workforce that you had. So their modeling shows in sort of the Northeast corner of this graph, the change in employment that would happen in an average week nationally if we um, embarked on that policy of raising the minimum wage to that $15 an hour. And you see that they say we would have, you know, a loss of, I don't know, that's probably about 800,000 jobs in the, you know, across the nation. So they're acknowledging that there is an offset in employment. Um, and then they did this little simulation on the change in the number of people in poverty in the um, southwest corner of this graphic, showing that, you know, on net it would... Um, it would most likely alleviate the number of people in poverty. So that sort of green, light green area around that point estimate on the line is kind of the margin of error. And then the change in the number of people entering and leaving policy. So I thought this was just a nice resource for you all to be aware of that's out there that you could use to sort of try and better understand at least what folks nationally are modeling around what would happen if you start moving minimum wage around, recognizing that, again, it's not, nothing's ever all positive or all negative. I did some work at the center a long time ago, back in 2006, when we passed Amendment 52, um, or retrospective to 2006. I did it obviously in 2015, but looking back at what happened when we passed the first minimum wage measure and trying to understand if we did see that, um, that employment effect in Colorado when we raised the minimum wage. And I found that for the folks who were employed in the lowest decile, so the lowest 10% of the, um, labor force, there was not a whole lot of evidence of a loss of jobs when we did that first minimum wage increase. 
Um, I haven't gone back and sort of adjusted this analysis for subsequent increases that we've done post 2015 and sort of the ramping up that we have now that looks at, um, you know, our requirement constitutionally to increase minimum wage statewide with, um, with inflation. But at least early on, there was not a whole lot of evidence. This little area around 2010 looks like, you know, there was some impact to those lower wage jobs in the wake of the um, minimum wage increase, but that's also sort of the, um, the halo of the great recession. And so if we were to draw trend lines through here, you would not see a significant loss. And of course, you know, there'd be some margin of error around this kind of analysis. It's probably very consistent with what the, um, what the range of, you know, potential outcomes the federal um, researchers have found looking at the impacts around around federal minimum wage. So at least initially, there there wasn't a lot of evidence from a macro perspective of this loss of jobs. Now that doesn't speak to you know you know X Y Z business establishment. And so there's certainly sort of micro firm level impacts that are much harder to get at that really you can only get at from hearing probably testimony from people who would be impacted. Um, having said all that, as I said to Yvonne, I was going to like share with you what little bit I have and what's out there, but then sort of pivot to a broader conversation about, you know, what does it take to keep labor markets healthy? And what does the Northern Colorado labor market look like? And does it sort of pass that test? So I had done some work um, a few years ago that I've updated, I've, that I've updated here looking at um, the share of the overall economy in the two larger, you know, the two main counties in, in your neighborhood, um, I'm actually down in Lafayette, even though we're affiliated with CSU, which is why I should say our, but I'm actually down in Boulder County right now, um, looking at where the concentration of economic activity lies. And so for Larimer County, almost half the economic activity is generated from three industrial sectors. It's manufacturing, um, what I called fire in a in an email with Yvonne and she I was like okay I can't use the acronyms um fire you'll see sometimes um shortened for finance insurance real estate rental leasing and um professional and business services so about one out of every two dollars of economic activity in Larimer County is generated in those three sectors um of private sector. Government's a big part also, obviously, because of the university, but I looked at this as a share of the private sector economy. Um, that same graph for Weld County looks like this, almost 60% of the um, economic activity in Weld County is concentrated in four major industries with, of course, sort of the, um, the behemoth being mining, um, oil and gas. And then, of course, construction, manufacturing, and then that same fire, finance, real estate. So the question is, is if you have that much of your economy um, concentrated in those industries in those two counties, you know, what does that mean in terms of creating jobs? Well, it turns out that in Larimer County, about one out of every three jobs, the gray, the light gray, or the kind of medium gray bars in this graph is the combination of those three industries. So you see the share of jobs in each one of those three industries um, as a share of the, the private employment in Larimer County. And so if I combine those three together, about one third of the, or, or three in 10 of the jobs um, currently, a little more than three in 10, are associated with those three um, industries that make up about half the economy in Larimer County. That same graph for Weld County shows us that about, you know, four out of 10 or closer to 45% in some years of those jobs come from those four major industries. And so the question then becomes, how do those jobs do at providing sort of the basis for what um, folks need in order to be sustainable? Um, and are they providing the base for a solid and healthy labor market in Northern Colorado? And so Yvonne shared with me, I didn't know this was out there, so I appreciate the um, tip on this, that the state has done some work on, you know, what does it mean to be a good job? 
And of course, the first thing probably most of us would think about if I asked you, you know, what makes a good job, you would say, well, the first thing is probably I need to make, make enough money to, um, you know, live the life that I at least need to live and to some extent would like to live. Um, beyond that, I, you know, I tend to agree with a lot of what they have below there. Um, because we live in a country where our health benefits and many of our other benefits come from our employment and not another um, source, it probably helps if that job can provide you with the benefits you need. And then you get into some of those more quality of life type um, of um, attributes that we would like to have from a job. You know, we'd like the flexibility that the schedule we want. We want to be safe. We want to be challenged. We want to feel like we have an opportunity for advancement. We want to have a sense of um, camaraderie and what do they call it here? Belonging with um, the people we work with. Um, when you get much below wages and benefits as an economist, it's a little hard to measure these things with data that already exist. Uh, you know, the only way for me to be able to go into those industrial sectors that I shared with you and see like how far up this triangle, which is very similar to, you know, what Maslow often says about, or not often says he's dead, but what he did say about, you know, what do you need at your base in order to be sustainable? And then what do you need to sort of achieve your best life? Um, so I set myself off looking for data on wages and then on benefits. And what I'll share with you is it's very easy to find data on wages and not so easy to find data that I thought was, was um, indicative of the benefit structure. So I'm going to focus really on that first one and look at, you know, what kind of wages are provided by the jobs that are creating sort of the bedrock of the economy in Northern Colorado? What does that mean for someone holding one of those jobs and, of course, making the average wage because, you know, we always swim in the sea of averages or drown in the sea of averages in economics um, to provide sort of one basic need for themselves, which, you know, you can't open the newspaper and not hear every single or read about every single day in Colorado, and that is housing. And I took the liberty of building into this presentation some work that we've done over the last couple of years that looks at the relationship between earnings and what you can afford in housing. And then I'm going to bring us back around and talk about service level jobs that are sort of not those bedrock industries, but are really necessary to have in order to keep an economy sort of functioning well. And I'll share with you a little bit about some work we're doing up in the mountains where that's become increasingly a challenge. And then we'll come back to the end to have a conversation about, you know, so what do we do about the fact that we really need like a full spectrum and not just these um, fundamental base jobs. So if we go back to um, those three major industries, here's the um, average weekly wage profile of um, those three major industries, I'm, I'm kind of moving you all around so I can see your face, but I can also see my graphics. Um, in Larimer County, so the wage profile compared to what the minimum wage would be, you can see that all of those jobs that are, you know, on average associated with those three major sort of foundational industrial categories in Larimer County, carry with them wages that are substantially above, as you would expect, the minimum wage. And so, um, A, we wouldn't expect them to be all that much impacted if you started raising. I mean, there's some argument that, you know, it pushes wage inflation all the way through. But these are jobs that are already paying, you know, significantly above. Here's that same profile for Weld County, same thing, the earnings on an average weekly basis. I have the data on annual, but you know, you can do it by multiplying by 52. Um, also far above what the minimum wage would be. And so it suggests that those jobs um, should at least be on average, you know, providing that first base layer of what the state says is a good job. And that is, you know, can you have wages that can support the life you need to live? So I thought, well, let me go to this model that we've built over the last couple of years and look at what it would mean for affording housing in both Larimer 
and Weld County, if you made the average wage of each one of those um, industrial categories and look to buy a house with that average wage in those counties. And so the way we do this modeling is we assume that the house cost to you is sustainable if the monthly carrying cost would not exceed 30% of your monthly wages. And that's a pretty, um, a pretty widely accepted standard in housing that your housing cost burden, if your housing cost exceeds 30% of your um, monthly wages. We assume when we do this modeling that you're carrying a mortgage with 20% down, a conventional mortgage where you're financing 80% of the cost of the house. We build in the property taxes based on the current residential assessment rate and the average county mills for the county. And then we add an increment for homeowners insurance and for utilities. And we look at what would be the housing costs that you could support with your average salary um, in you know, the county, in this case, Larimer. And it turns out that on one average salary in each one of those three industries, you can see the cost of housing that would be supportable by um, someone making the average. So in manufacturing, approximately $400,000 house and finance about 330 and in professional and business services, the three about 375,000. Um, Dr. If, Resnick? Yes? Real, real quick, that $402,000 for manufacturing, is that the price of the house or you, you rolled in a whole bunch of other things, right? That's the that's the price of the house that you could buy and the cost and the the bundle of monthly costs for that house that we did this modeling on are your your mortgage payment, your property taxes, your utilities, okay. and your um homeowners insurance. What's gotcha. missing from here is an HOA and it's because we don't have enough data. So if this house is in an HOA, you know, covered community where you have that additional cost or a metro district, what you could afford would be less because that would be part of your monthly payment. I should have okay, said that. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, when I look at this, I think it's probably not so easy to find a house for $330,000 in Larimer County anymore. Um, however, remember this is one salary. And so if we were to double that and assume that you had two people in the household who were contributing to the housing costs, once you get to sort of a second earner contributing, those jobs are at least doing a fairly good job of providing sort of a foundational basis. And I'll, um, show you a little more about how it kind of lays out more spatially in um, Colorado. If we run that same analysis and weld on those four industries that are sort of those, those base industries, you see the value of housing that would be supportable, again, by someone earning at the average in that industry. So, you know, there's plenty of people who earn below the average and there's some people who earn substantially more than the average. And so then we got curious and we teamed up with our friends at the Keystone Policy Center about six or eight months ago about this particular question, largely with respect to teacher salaries. And so what I'm gonna jump to here and show you, and then you'll have the website for it and you can go play with it, is a application that the Colorado Future Center built for our colleagues at Keystone at the school district level that looked at what share of housing by valuation. So now we're talking by assessor valuation, not by the selling price, but including those other components, including the property taxes, including the, um, the homeowners insurance and including utilities, what share of housing would be affordable? Let's see, is it not gonna let me? I might have to get out of, oh, here we go. Would be affordable for um, for teachers at the average. And then I'll kind of circle back to, to what we were talking about. 
So this, um, this base map here shows you statewide if you are a teacher making the average salary in these um, geographies now are school districts, what share of housing would be affordable to you um, with one average salary trying to support housing? So this is related, and, and I'll kind of pivot off this in a moment. This is related to the teachers in that district earning the average teacher salary for the district. So if we go up here to, you know, Pooter R1, if you're making the average salary in, in the Pooter district, you can you can essentially afford about 13% of the housing. That doesn't mean that housing is available for sale. It just means by assessor valuation of the stock in the school district, that's the amount that's affordable. Um, and I can kind of uh, cursor around here and you can see what happens with affordability as you move from school district to school district. But this is specifically tied to a teacher making the average. So then we thought as long as we're building this, why don't we go in and let people look at, well, what does it mean for my salary, whether I'm a teacher or not? And we built in a mechanism here where you can select your salary in $5,000 increments up to $125,000 and see what share of housing is available for, um, for you know, your salary. So we could, and I, let's see if I can, can seamlessly toggle back and forth here. Um, if we look at what the, I don't know, where do I have the, do I have the annual salary for any of these? I don't, so we would have to, okay, we're gonna do math on the fly here. Um, why is it not letting me? So in Larimer County, let's take um, manufacturing about approximately $2,000 a week. So 2,000 times 52 is about $100,000 a year, right? So you could set this application to the $100,000 a year and you could go through and see about what share of the housing would be affordable for someone at that um, level of earnings. So I wanted to, and this will kind of highlight the part of the state that we're talking about here. I wanted to um, draw this application to your attention because I think it's a nice way of looking at the relationship between the wages in those sort of foundational jobs and kind of what the state's saying a good job is, like its ability to provide for you the basic needs, the basic of which for you know most all of us is housing. I'll also draw your attention to um, what this map looks like when we get down to annual salaries that are in the 40 or $45,000, you start getting to very small percentages of housing that are affordable for people earning at that level. And the reason I draw that to your attention is because I wanna bring our conversation back to, this is always so awkward to do when you're, um, back to the other folks in the economy who um, sort of make an economy healthy and um, sustainable. So if we think about these jobs that are um, associated with those top three or four industrial categories in Weld and Larimer County. So this one in three jobs in Larimer County and this essentially four out of 10 jobs in Weld County. I had from some previous work I did in Northern Colorado, a set of what are called multipliers for um, actually for Weld County. So this is a, a very much an approximation because I didn't have 
Larimer County numbers um, specific, but the structure of those two economies is not probably enough different that this number isn't sort of in the right ballpark. And what multipliers do is they can tell you what, um, what base industries, one of the things they can do is they can tell you what the impact on sort of other sectors is from employment in those base industries. So for example, you have jobs in those base industries like mining, manufacturing, um, professional and business services, the, the industries we were talking about. There's um, economic activity or dollars that come into the region to support the workers in those jobs. So let's say you hold one of those jobs. You know, you have a mining job in Weld County and you get paid at the end of the week or the end of the month and you take that paycheck and you decide I'm going to go home and take my family out to dinner or go to the movies or you know, go see a sporting event, go to CSU football, whatever. And you spend money doing those activities. And then that spending creates obviously demand for labor in sectors that support your being able to do those activities. So if you go out to a restaurant, then there's people there who are cooking and serving. If you go shopping, there's retail workers. And, you know, if you stay in a hotel, there's hospitality workers. You sort of see where I'm getting here. So that kind of re-spending effect of the earnings from those primary jobs um, creates a multiplier effect through the economy and creates not only economic activity, but demand for labor. And those multipliers will quantify all of those impacts. When I apply the Weld County multipliers, again, I didn't have Larimer County, so this is you know ballpark kind of numbers, I get that in the retail sector alone, those primary jobs will essentially spit off or spin off or create or need about 14,000 retail jobs across those two counties to support just those base activities that are happening in those primary sectors. And this is where this whole question about a healthy economy becomes trickier because those jobs don't have salaries that match those primary level jobs. And of course, you all know that, that these conversations around minimum wage and what do we do about people who are working in these jobs that are, um, you know, leaving them living very much at the economic margin, what does that mean? And what's the, you know, right approach to handling sort of that challenge? And um, what does it mean for keeping a, a a sort of local economy healthy. If I run the same analysis on those jobs and look at their earnings on an average weekly basis relative to the minimum wage, of course, they're going to average over the minimum wage because you can't really pay below. And But relative to those sort of base industries, you start to see the great difference in earnings. And when we look at, again, putting it on that kind of same scale of what is affordable for housing, now we get to a situation where it really is probably impossible to support a home um, with a retail average. And this is average for someone who's working every week of the year. As we all know, in many cases, people don't get schedules that even support earning at this level. But this is sort of the average weekly pay for people who can be employed full time it becomes pretty much impossible to support a home. And we could go back, I'm not gonna take you back there, but that's why I drew your attention to what that map looks like when we go from about $100,000 down to the $40,000. And right away, you see that in some of those districts that are closer into Fort Collins, there's virtually nothing that's affordable for someone. Of course, this is to own a home, You know, rental would look different. Um, and it also means that if they're spending that full 30%, what they have left to live on monthly is very close to or at the level where um, people in those industries are making very difficult choices. So particularly if you have any children in a household that need any kind of child care, and you're looking at having about $2,000 left over or $2,500 left over per month, after you pay for your housing, um, it becomes 
almost, um, I won't say impossible, but very, very challenging to support, um, you know, having a sustainable household, which leads us to where I'll end today and then open us up to have a conversation is that in order to keep labor markets healthy, those core jobs are always gonna spin off, well, until we have robots, and I'll get to that at the end, are always gonna spin off those secondary jobs. And you know, it's sort of the never ending challenge that those secondary kind of more local service jobs um, almost never pay at the same you know, salary as those core jobs. And increasingly in Colorado are not paying at a salary where um, you know, those basic needs are being met by your job. And when Ivana and I had our first conversation, we had, we're very close to each other in age, and we had this sort of reminiscence about how when we were younger, those jobs that we're talking about weren't as much relied upon by people for sort of professions. Like, you know, probably all of us had a stint early in our life in either retail or restaurants or some other kind of service job. And then, you know, for many of us, it was our expectation that that was the way we paid our way through college or, I mean, I worked those jobs in high school. Um, but then, you know, we went off and had a career in a job where we weren't trying to rely on those service level jobs for an entire lifetime. Our economy has shifted over the years where more and more people are trying to rely on those jobs as supporting a household and supporting their life. And so for them, while minimum wage is, you know, for us at the macro level is um, admittedly imperfect as I have there and, you know, one policy tool, um, for them, it can be, in some cases, the difference between sustaining um, those core things, particularly in this economy, locally housing, that are necessary to be stable in your life and not. And from work that we've done, you know, largely in resort communities, but more and more the metros becoming like that, to have that healthy economy, you need those service jobs. I mean, most of us um, rely on those folks you know, in our everyday life, in some cases for necessities, and in some cases just for our quality of life. And we've done quite a bit of work up in um, Route County with the Yampa Valley Housing Authority, who are working on um, a development plan for a large land um, donation they received called the Brown Ranch. You might be following some of this. And we were doing some, or some um, health equity and housing as a as a social determinant of health work with them, but it be, was becoming very evident to us and we were hearing testimonials from people in town that you know, two or three nights a week, restaurants weren't opening because they didn't have people to you know, work in restaurants, that retailers were unable to keep shops open, that the resort was you know, having challenges finding workers. And so while I'm not suggesting that resort economies are sort of, indicative of, you know, sort of more diversified economies like we have along the front range, we are starting to see some of those stresses where a lot of those service workers who we rely on are increasingly challenged in, um, you know, in being sustainable in an economy where housing particularly is um, not affordable on the wages that they're earning. And so while I don't have all the answers for you, I you know, hope that gives a little bit of context. And as I was putting this together, I just thought I'd throw it out there. The wild card in all of this is what does artificial intelligence and um, you know, robotics and, um, and sort of non-human demand for, for services and labor mean for all of this. And that's just something to sort of, we can have kind of a fun conversation about or ponder, but you know, it's very possible that in a short period of time, this conversation is going to evolve from something like minimum wage to something more related to some sort of basic income type policies. Because if we get to a point where 
um, there isn't even a demand for labor in some of those industries, then we have an entirely different kind of um, economic challenge and policy challenge on our hands. So hopefully that, yeah, that's about, about the right amount of time I hope to talk and then leave some time for us to have just a back and forth conversation or for me to answer any questions um, or, you know, whatever is the, um, the, the desire of the group. It's again, we have this nice small group. So hopefully we can have an interesting conversation about this. Bill, you go ahead. It looks like you want to ask something. <laughs> no, actually, actually, this is um, this is in a bit. This is quite scary um, when you think in terms of keeping an economy going. Uh, and as you were looking at the issue of teachers, um, my my son and my daughter-in-law are both high school teachers in the Chicago area, and we keep thinking, "Well, oh, gee, wouldn't it be wonderful if they could move out here?" they couldn't afford to move out here uh, cons considering at least in the school district in which they teach they make considerably more than what is being uh, what you're showing there and it's it's kind of amazing when we think in terms of and I'll just I'll just make my point and I'll get off my soapbox um we reward the people who entertain us and we neglect the people who nurture us and so when you think in terms of where some of these wages should be, they should be a, a, a lot better than they are. And, and that's a side, that, that's my soapbox issue. I'm just a crabby old man at times, as Yvonne knows. Okay. And you know, it's interesting. I'll say one more thing, because I, I was gonna add a bullet and then I forgot to. Yvonne and I got chatting before everyone else jumped on. You know, we often turn to education as sort of the way out of this, you know, you know, this, this idea that when we were younger, these service jobs were sort of a stepping stone and probably the way most of us moved beyond them was to go and get some higher education. But I started thinking about, I'll even make you more scared, Bill, like in a world where, I don't know if any of you watched 60 Minutes this week, but the first story on Sunday night was with the gentleman who I guess invented the first neural network, which led to all the you know explosion of AI. And he was talking about the fact that, you know, it's very possible that we've set ourselves off on a course where these silicon-based forms, whether they're life or not, I don't know, um, could actually have their own self-determination. And so at some point, you know, it's kind of like the science fiction movies coming true. But if that is really true, then it even got me thinking about like, what is the policy prescription? You know, we, we often talk about, well, we move people through higher and higher education so they can move into professions that can support the kind of um, living they need. And, you know, and I totally agree with you, like, like primary education, secondary education, healthcare, a lot of those jobs, even with all that education, people can't afford to support right. their living. But, you know, for some folks, it's the answer. But then if those jobs start getting replaced by, um, you know, if AI are, are reading CAT scans instead of radiologists, and, you know, you start thinking about the cascade of things that could happen, then we really are in a situation where we have to think in an entirely different way about what makes a healthy economy. And so that's probably way beyond where we can go today. But I was toying with putting in this notion about like, is there, we've done a lot of work on, you know, the, the value of a degree in higher ed from both an economic and from like a quality of life perspective. And, you know, right now the data are very clear that, you know, the more education on average you have sort of the you know, the, the higher you score in all of those, you have better health outcomes, you have, you know, obviously higher, typically higher earnings, you have more, you know, better quality of life outcomes, but that could get turned on its head also. So yeah. when we're thinking about policy prescriptions in this time, that could be very, very rapidly changing. It's, it's, it's a, um, it's a, it's a tough subject to think about. Anyway, that's, you know, so I didn't add that last bullet because I thought that was going to lead us 
in a whole other way. But when you started talking about, you know, what it means for, you know, people we love, um, it gets even scarier when you think about what's going to happen to jobs and what is going to be a good job in the future. Okay, I'm, I'm, I've got one more comment, but I'll let somebody else jump in first. I don't want to grab everything. Blake, did you have a question or a comment? You're muted. How about now? Yes, you're good. You. I love it. No, this is a, a fascinating topic, Phyllis. Thank you so much for this. Um, I'm with Labor Jack, and we provide variable workforce solutions for a variety of different businesses. And we continue to be just shocked at how many different industries in, as a whole say that labor is their biggest challenge. Um, we're working with the forestry department right now, something that most people don't think about, well-funded. Um, labor is their biggest issue, and it's it's very seasonal. Um, and we're continuing to see a lot of trends where people are are leaving, because of everything you mentioned, are, are leaving, you know, kind of this, what had often been considered the stable workforce environment and looking for something that's a little bit more flexible and can do these things and that allows them a different quality of life. But Bill, you also struck a chord when you were on your soapbox, as you said. Um, I remember my my grandfather and my dad getting into a fight many years ago when my grandpa sold his season tickets to the Vikings because he said, we're going the same way as the Roman Empire, where we're paying our entertainers more than we're paying our educators. And I have a I have a problem with that. And that was 40 some odd years ago. And to, to wonder what he would be doing and thinking about it now as it has continued to evolve is, you know, it is concerning. So um, as you know, somebody who's in the thick of things, working with a lot of people that are finding their out of college jobs and um, even in college income sources, um, it, it's interesting to just kind of see the the scope of the landscape and and listen to like hey how, how do I build the the future and the initial nest egg to get into the home ownership market because the rental market is pigeonholing you it's it's interesting I don't have a lot of solutions um other than you know you just got to continue to work hard and um and I would actually point to the fact that there's a lot of great opportunities in the trades that are continuing to get overlooked and um, electricians, plumbers are continuing to be in high demand. Um, and <clears throat> anybody who wants to work hard, I think that there's opportunities out there, but it's, the, the landscape is changing and um, it would be really unfortunate to spend all that money on the education and, and get into a field that AI and technology continues to innovate. So. That is my rant. Um, thanks for letting me have the soapbox for a little bit. Well, it's a quick question. Are you familiar with the work of the late Lester Thoreau? Uh, uh, somewhat, yeah. He wrote a book in the 1990s that just shot, it, it really made me think about labor. His point was, the book was um, head to head the coming economic war between Japan, West Germany, and the United States. That's when we were worried about Japan taking things over and Germany had not been unified. But his conclusion was uh, politicians want great paying jobs because uh, we get the tax money from great paying jobs. But his conclusion was businesses is smart. They will put the jobs where the talent exists. And he said that of the three countries, we were going to lose because of our education system. And uh, uh, apprenticeships were winning in 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 uh, German, West Germany. And uh, anyway, it's a long story. But the fascinating thing about that is he redid the book in 2000, came to the same conclusion. And at that point in time, it's all about having, you know, get a great, if you want a great job, get a great education. But your point about artificial intelligence is fascinating because we're about to have a white collar layoff due to AI. And we have to rethink back to, I think, some of the things that are we should be focusing on, which is fascinating. And Blake, I'll just make one quick comment to you. I, my brother-in-law is a carpenter contractor who has got a good living and put four kids through college. 
because he's a carpenter contractor <laughs> and he made it. Amen. Amen. Yeah, there's uh, <clears throat> there's plenty of opportunity. I'm sure he's busier now than ever. Yep. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I haven't done, obviously, the study that Thoreau's done, but I've worked in the developing world a lot with young economists. And this is very unscientific. And I'm not intending to um, denigrate, you know, an entire generation of young folks in this country. But having taught here and having worked with young professionals in the developing world, they're so hungry and they're so motivated. And it does make me worry that we've gotten complacent. Like I, um, and again, it's not everyone, you know, there's still amazing innovation and there's amazing motivation that come out of this country, but, but it did get a lot easier here for a while for, for, you know, some folks and, and this sort of expectation to your point about, you know, we pay the people who entertain us more than the people who educate and care for us. Like this notion of like being able to not have to work as hard and have things come to us scares me a little bit about, you know, our, our um, kind of developing labor force here. Cause I see what what these folks, I've, mer I've worked mostly in Africa and, you know, they're investing in their education. They want, you know, they're, they're working 12, 15 hours, you know, I, I come in in the morning, they're there, I leave at night, they're there. They really are hungry to work hard and get ahead. And um, I don't know, I don't, I, you know, I that part scares me also. I, it, I just put it out there because, um, it feels different in countries that have been sort of highly developed for a long time. There's a different attitude here than in places that are still trying to move forward. Certainly a lot of things that we all take for granted here and I'm, I'm guilty of it myself, but I think that we're going to continue to see a lot of jobs outsourced. I mean, we saw manufacturing get outsourced um, to where it was cheaper, but I think we're going to start to see a lot of white collar software development, um, financial analytics, chief financial officer roles. I mean, a lot of that stuff is already happening to where it's going overseas to somebody who <clears throat> is, is very, very qualified and can do it at 20% of the cost of somebody in America and are very, very grateful for that opportunity. And, and AI is going to make it worse because finance and accounting is all about numbers and computers do numbers really well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it is, you know, I started thinking back to, you know, where Yvonne and I started this conversation about is minimum, you know, minimum wage is one tool. Certainly it serves like you know, a sliver of the market. And then, but then I started thinking about like, so what are the policy recommendations that you would make to keep a labor force healthy for the next 50 years? And I kept coming back to, there's this big uncertainty about, you know, what does, what will that pyramid look like that the state has for what is a good job in an environment where so many of those jobs, you're not just competing with other humans for that job, but you're competing with a computer for that job. And so does that whole hierarchy, like does the start be um, a computer can't take my job and then we build off of that. And, and you know, I started going down all these kind of crazy tangents, which probably isn't what you really wanted me to come here and talk about, but I thought that um, you know, it's worth putting that out there and thinking about, um, you know, what are the what are the policy um, levers in a world in a labor market that that is increasingly distorted by competing with with um, AI type applications. Well, I just um, I can use the environment on um, in welcome workforce symposium when there's anyone else who's thinking about it. But they talked a lot about AI. Um, so I work in community resources at CSU for the College of Vietnam and Biomedical Sciences. And uh, the presenters, I felt like left the team. I thought, what's the symposium? 
they talked about AI is coming and it's a wonderful, great thing. And then the talk is over. <laughs> it is a really a gray area in the space of talent acquisition where I work because um, many organizations are talking about the benefit of it and how it makes work better. But there's so many um, factors that make it worse too. So I think when it comes to policy, like you're saying, it is still very much a gray area. They really try to push the fact that technology is only as good as the people behind it. So their advice is go out and learn how to leverage AI. And I've been trying to do that. And it's really challenging because that's not where my passion is. I'm in HR because I'm a people person. So to say, figure out how to use this technology, it's on your own. It's not exciting to me. <laughs> And I think, you know, thank you for that comment, because I think that 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 could be an outcome too, right? Like, I mean, labor gets more productive when we have the technology that can help us be more productive. And economic theory would say that as labor gets more productive, labor gets paid more because its returns are greater. And so, you know, the 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 best outcome of this is that this technology does make all of us more productive and therefore we, you know, it supports higher wages, which should make things more sustainable. The alternative outcome, though, gets more frightening, right? Like if it gets to the point where for many of these um, occupations within these industries, humans aren't really necessary at all, and then we get into a whole different um, conversation. But I think that's a really good point in the short term that probably the places where folks are going to have the best opportunity for earnings are, are in, in occupations within industries where they can leverage the advances that, that technology and other product productivity enhancements bring to their, their sort of human job, right? Um, and so, you know, there probably are, to your point about the symposium, there are probably strengths to pull on there when looking at um, policy options that provide for the opportunity for folks to have sort of sustainable living off of jobs. Well, it's noon and this has been an amazing conversation. I'm sure we could continue for hours on this topic. So I appreciate you all joining us today. I totally appreciate Dr. Phyllis Resnick for um, great information and great conversation about this. It's not, not a right answer, but there's a whole lot around this as well. So, so appreciate you doing our Tuesday Talent Series this week. Um, next week on the 17th, we have our next session, Getting Out of Your Comfort Zone at Work with Chalice Springfield, who is super fun, very interesting. And she said, this course will help people identify the differences between a growth and a fixed mindset and provide real world, world tools for embracing risk, overcoming fear, and intentionally stepping outside of their comfort zone. And that's always something we expect as employers for our employees to do. And that's the hardest thing for them to do, I think. So it'll be a great session. So thank you all for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you so nice much. Nice to meet everyone. Thank Ron, you so I'll send you, a, you an email with the slides. Is That's that perfect. all you need from me now? Okay. That's it. Thank you so okay. much. Sounds good. Uh-huh. Right. Bye. Bye. -bye.